Benedictine monasteries have attracted English men and women to the monastic life for nearly 1,500 years. God continues to call people to the monastic life today. There are currently over 300 English Benedictine monks and nuns in abbeys and priories not only in England, but also in the United States, Peru and Zimbabwe. The subject of this film is the way that English Benedictine monks and nuns respond to the call of Christ today. The Gospel story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus provides the framework for this. Like the disciples on the road, English Benedictines encounter the risen Lord on their journey of faith. He invites them to a consecration that leads them into a communion where he gives them their commission. Monastic life begins with a personal encounter with Christ. The Lord calls, and in response, monks and nuns join the Emmaus disciples in crying out, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? In the opening words of the rule, a voice speaks personally and directly to the disciple. We are invited to listen and to attend with the ear of the heart. The rule dramatizes this encounter as the Lord seeking his workmen in a crowd. God's initiative is the foundation of a vocation, yet the rule also says that the person who responds is the one who yearns for life and desires to see good days. God's call meets our search. In the Emmaus story, the encounter with the risen Jesus propels the disciples into a restored relationship with the community in Jerusalem, where the experience of their encounter is confirmed. They are told, the Lord has risen indeed. Similarly, those who hear the call to monastic life discover that their monastic community enables them to remain faithful. The monastery is the workshop where the practice of the spiritual craft prepares us for heaven. We ascend there by humility, but our perseverance in the monastery is a work of grace that transforms our human nature. We are conformed to Christ by our monastic profession. This profession involves a threefold promise of stability, conversatio morum, and obedience. Poverty, chastity, and obedience are implied in the monastic life, but they were not formulated as three vows until many centuries after St. Benedict's time. In the first place, monastic consecration involves stability, persevering, in the monastic life in a particular community. Stability here is connected to the people rather than to the place. Next comes conversatio morum, which means observing the lifestyle and practices of the monastic tradition, both the universal qualities of the monastic life and the way this community has encountered Christ. Finally, obedience, in the first instance to God and then to his will as disclosed in the community. This is the blessing of mutual obedience, which St. Benedict describes with such feeling in the final chapters of the rule.
the abbot and abbess, by their decisions and teaching, help us to grow in that obedience, which we live out by serving the good of our brethren. From start to finish, monastic consecration is a personal relationship with Jesus, but always lived out in communion with others. The Emmaus disciples invited the stranger to supper with them, and when he took the bread, their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus, even as he vanished. They then returned to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples. This communion with the risen Christ and with each other is at the heart of monastic living. The Acts of the Apostles describes the Christian community as a communion, the same word used by St. Paul to describe the communion of the Holy Spirit that brings people together and that finds expression in the communion of the Eucharist. The first Christian monks called their monastery a communion, while in modern times communion is the key to the Church's self-understanding. Pope St. John Paul described the Church as the sign and instrument of intimate union with God and of the unity of the human race. In monasteries, this communion of love is seen when respect and forgiveness overcome the tensions of community life so that Jesus makes himself present in the human relationships. St. Benedict describes a monastery as a school of the Lord's service, where communion is learnt and practised within the wider communion of the Church. Each member of a community is disabled and wounded in some way, yet is not to be lived without. The rule insists on caring for the sick and the vulnerable, including the overburdened and the wayward. The leadership of the abbot or abbess supports people along this path of communion, and the monastic enclosure sets boundaries within which it can be nourished. Above all, the solemn celebration of the Eucharist is the source and summit of the monastery's communion. Flowing from this is the liturgy of the hours, which occupies a primary place consecrating the day to God and leading to a sense of God's presence everywhere. The Benedictine life is centred on prayer, and English Benedictines have a tradition of contemplative prayer as found in the English mystics. This prayer is enriched by and flows into the reading of Scripture, Lexio Divina. Yet, Every Christian community is founded on frailty, so a school of communion has to be a school of love. Contemporary psychological insights are beyond the text of the rule, but are not beyond its perspective. With such insights and with monastic wisdom, fraternal love in Christ changes human relationships and leads to a new solidarity. Such solidarity extends beyond individual monastic communities to include communion with all people of goodwill, especially with other communities of believers within the Church. And it is the Church which has given the English Benedictine congregation its commission. Jesus calls us to fellowship in monastic communion and commissions us to go forth and bear much fruit, to wake up the world. At Pentecost, 
the disciples are together in the upper room. But the gift of the Spirit cannot be contained. The disciples are commissioned to share this new life with everyone. They do so as a communion of disciples, bearing common witness to Jesus. The monastic communion into which Christ has called us is itself a mission. The gospel witness of monks and nuns is to show the difference that Jesus makes to us personally by the way we live together. This is the witness we offer others. Going forth is not about how far we travel, but how far we live out the monastic life. This is why monastic enclosure is important to monks and nuns. Without a strong centre, there can be no life to share. Without absolute fidelity to Christ, there can be no consecration in the life of the Spirit. But Jesus commissions us to spread the gospel too. It is the call to a renewed evangelization. That is one side to the commission. The other is to root the gospel life of the monastery in the culture, in the societies and among the people where we live. Traditionally, our communities have spread the gospel in pastoral work, including hospitality, education and scholarship. Hospitality is an increasingly important way of doing this. A monastery is a place of reconciliation and dialogue too, a place where people can grow in faith by sharing the way monastic communion is lived out. Pope St. John Paul II said, Consecrated men and women are in mission by virtue of their very consecration. The work of God is what gets us out of bed and spells out the shape and meaning of our days. It's central to our desire to live the present with passion. The worship of God and our common prayer is the work St. Benedict puts above all others. It is the source and summit of our lives. Amen.